Sounds True presents Transforming Your Relationship with Money, Session 7, with Joe Dominguez. Now we get to the part that I like. <laughs> I like the whole thing. Get to the part I, see, my training is as an engineer. I went to college to be an engineer. And numbers and nice left brain stuff and linear stuff, that, that, that's easy for me. That makes sense to me. I, you know, the, the first half was what my struggle was, what my exploration and discovery was. You know, as that sank in, then it, it evolved into what we'll be getting now, which was how to quantify that, how to bring that down to nuts and bolts. That was my expertise. That was my field of, of uh, you know, comfort. And I call it the baby steps, the nine baby steps. That's what we're going to be covering, nine very simple steps. Now, there's a catch about their simplicity, and that is that each one is vital. Obviously, if I could make them eight baby steps, I would make them eight baby steps. <laughs> I'm not getting paid by the hour. I'm not getting paid. I, you know, the less I have to talk, the happier I'll be. <laughs> nine is what works. <laughs> Now, I say that to you because there's a lot of you that are going to try to make it into eight. <laughs> and then wonder a year from now, how come this isn't working? Well, very simple, because you try to make it eight. I mean, imagine a, a chain with, you know, eight, nine links. Well, I think I'll take this one out. Oh, I ain't got a chain no more. Right? Or a recipe and just, you know, leave out a major ingredient. Or whatever analogy you want. Okay, this is nine steps. Each one of them is vital. The whole thing holds together. This is the shortcut. <laughs> hey, here's this dude up here telling you that in three hours now, he's going to tell you how to go from this whole new conceptualization of money to being financially independent, all the information that you need, and he's going to do it in three hours. And you are so wise that you say, well, I think I can do it by lopping off this step. Good luck. Let me know. All I know is that over the years, when I go back, and there's, there's a lot of feedback from folks that have done the program. When I go back and visit a, a town that I gave a talk two or three years earlier, and somebody uh, invite me over and say, hey, you know, I've been doing the program, and it uh, you know, has been working pretty good, but I'm not really on course. And I ask, let's see your paperwork. And we begin to look through it, and I say, uh, where's uh, step five? Uh, oh, step, step, step five. Well, this is step five? Well, you've got four and six. You know, we're step five. <laughs> oh, I didn't need to do that. And of course, you know, to the most casual observer, that's the one that they needed to do. That's the one that bridged four and six. <laughs> Last analogy on that is, you know, you stop and ask somebody direction, you know, how do I get to such and such a place? And the guy says, well, you know, uh, go down about three stoplights, make a left to, to the first stoplight, then make a right for three blocks. You know? And you're so smart, you go down there, and then you turn the other direction. Or you skip that direction entirely. And then you begin to curse him. Right? Okay. Step one. We're now starting off with the knowledge, the assumption, that all that money is, is that which you trade life energy for. That's our foundation. We have certain other things. That life energy has a value beyond making money, making of money. All those things that we discussed around purpose and all that other stuff. That's your own self-exploration. That's the foundation to this. What would you do when you have a totally new roadmap, a totally new situation, well, look back. How does this apply, or how can I work with this for what went before? So it's the same thing. Step one is making your peace with the past in terms of your money. That's all it is. How do you do that? First, find out how much of that stuff has flowed in your life. In other words, how much have you made in your lifetime? And it's incredible, the few people that have ever bothered to do that. To look at, here they've been trading a third of their lives 
for this stuff, they have no idea how much of this stuff has flowed in. Much easier to complain about how little of it there is now instead of perceive the quantities that have flowed in. So that's the first step. That's the first half of the first step. Find out how much money has come into your life. Now you have records, right? <laughs> the same people that don't have records are the ones that think that every April 15th, they're pulling one over on Uncle Sam. <laughs> Uncle Sam has records. <laughs> and you can get them. Very simple procedure. They have been keeping track. Unless you've been really cheating outrageously, uh, they've been keeping track. Social Security Administration, one of Uncle Sam's girlfriends, has been <laughs> keeping very close tabs and you can go down to your local Social Security office and look them up in the phone book and just ask for that form and send it off and three weeks later you will get a very interesting statement. It's your statement of lifetime earnings. Yeah. And those that have pretty strong stomachs will proceed to compare them to what they've been turning in into their income tax, I mean, you know, filings and be blown away how generous Uncle Sam has been in not nailing you. <laughs> you will be filled with forgiveness <laughs> because uncle has been forgiving you for a long time and you'll learn that <laughs> it's true that isn't enough I mean that's that's the basic step it's also useful to look back I mean there were non social security type jobs that you had all the way back to high school. How, how much did you make in that summer job? <laughs> make your peace with it. Know about it. That's, that's what, really what I mean by making your peace with it. Know how much money came into your life. Now, the utility of that, it isn't just an abstraction of making your peace with your past, that kind of you know, philosophical abstraction. It's also very nitty gritty. It'll blow you away. For most people, it'll blow them away how much money has flowed into their lives. No kidding. Here's how this step walked into my life. I was 21 years old and I was doing my great adventure uh, going cross country on a motorcycle. This is back during the Beatnik era in 1958. And San Francisco was the Mecca. And I was a writer, so I was going to go to the Mecca, that kind of stuff, and finally get away from New York City. And uh, I found myself in Denver with 10 cents in my pocket. That's all I had left. My motorcycle broken down, and it was in a shop, and I had six more days left in a flop house, paid up in a flop house on Larimer Street, before they made it into Larimer Square, some artsy craftsy thing, when it was just bums row, you know, uh, skid row. And it was a dead of summer, hot, stinking. Mm. It was a pretty depressing moment in my life. I, you know, a month earlier, I had a great adventure, and you know, a couple of bucks in my pocket, and I'm going off to see the world. And now my, my wheels are, you know, all taken apart in somebody's workbench, and it's hot, and I'm broke. And the way I'm eating, believe it or not, was there was a diner on Broadway, and I was going by it just out of frustration, wanting to get some fresh air at midnight one night, and. Uh, I saw that the lady was closing up the, the sleazy, greasy spoon type of place, and uh, I, I mooched for the first time. I, I went up and I said, do you have any food around? I'm hungry. I haven't eaten in two days. And she said, oh, yeah, we got some things on the griddle. Let me give them to you. She was very motherly, and I'm you know, 20 years old and fresh-faced, innocenti. Uh, and that became my nightly tradition. As they closed up every night, I went there and and whatever was left on the griddle, you know, 11 hot dogs. <laughs> Get me going. <clears throat> the first day that I had gotten that flop house, when I kind of saw how dire my straits were, uh, I had written uh, to my father in New York. We didn't have the kind of relationship where I could ask him to send a couple of bucks or anything else. Forget that. But that was my hope in the back of my mind, you know. Uh, so he was very kind. He forwarded all my mail. <laughs> so I'm sitting in this flop house, 
and I'm opening the mail, hoping against hope that somehow, you know, there's an income tax refund or something, you know, what's going to bail me out of this? And the last one that I opened up was an official envelope, and I opened it up, and it was a statement of lifetime earnings from Social Security. <laughs> I don't know how I got I hadn't requested it. Apparently, I have found out since that you don't get it unless you request it and have to sign your name. I was 21 years old. I look at this thing, and I scream. <laughs> it showed that I had earned $21,000. I think that's what it was, $17,000, something like that. And I've got a dime in my pocket. <laughs> yeah, you want to feel miserable? You know, <laughs> where did it all go? I don't even have happy memories for it. You know? <laughs> what I own is six more days, three more days in this flop house, a bike that's in pieces, you know, the clothes on my back, that's it. That's all I got there. $17,000, what happened? You know, going nuts, going crazy around that one. It was just an insane figure. Well, I've been working since I was 13, you know, whether it was newspaper this or that, or grocery store delivery boy, and so on, you know, and that piles up. But what it showed me was, if I could earn this kind of money without even thinking about it, what if I thought about it? <laughs> <laughs> What if I decided to, to do something with it instead of blow it off? And it gave me self-confidence. It let me know that I was capable of doing that. Okay? A similar situation, a talk I did a couple of years ago, about a month after the talk, I got a phone call from this lady who had been divorced for a number of years and had a very low self-esteem. And she called me up to tell me that that was the most life-changing thing that I could have advised her to do. When she got that statement of lifetime earnings, she realized, see, her movie had been that she had contributed nothing to the relationship, to the past relationship, to the marriage, that she was just this, uh, um, you know, burden financially. And when she got that statement, she realized that during the eight years of her marriage, she had been contributing quite a bit. There it showed. You know, they listed year by year. And it just, just changed the whole way that she held herself. And there's a lot of other stories like that. So that's part of making your peace with the past. Know how much has flowed into your life in the past. The second half of this step, what have you got to show for it? Those words are already negatively loaded. I heard that. <laughs> it's a negative load to that word, but that's, that's your implication. Here you have put out X number of hours of your lifetime. What have you got to show for it? If you're about honoring this gift called your life, you, know, you would think that you'd know what you have to show for the energy you put out into this thing called work or making a dying or whatever you want to call it. That's the first thing that a business has to do, just to get into business, right? They have to set up a balance sheet. You are a business. An individual is a business. You got money coming in, you got money going out, and you got a certain amount of labor in the middle. It's a business. So part of that step, the second half is, what have you got to show for it? All that means is setting up a balance sheet. It's no big deal. All that a balance sheet is, is a list of what's owned and what's owed, or assets and liabilities. You can break it down into fixed assets, stuff that you don't, you're not likely to turn into money tomorrow. It's going to be a little more difficult to get cash out of it. And totally liquid assets, fixed assets and liquid assets, which you can convert to cash pretty quick. But it's about everything. It's about listing everything. So that you have a picture. This will become the picture of what it is that you have created in the world out of that money. Very grounded. You'll have a very direct relationship with what the past, with the money in the past that has flowed in your life, has come down to. Now that means everything you own, you will list and give a cash value to. A 
Okay, you can, if you own a house, get it appraised. No big deal. Find out the blue book value in the car. Call the bank. They usually will give you the blue book value in your car. Then begin to go, of course, all your assets in terms of bank accounts and certificates of deposit or anything of that sort, obviously. But it's all the way down. Go through each room in the house and assign a value to that lamp and to that couch. Go to a swap meet on a, on a Saturday afternoon. Find out what other people are pricing equivalent stuff for. Everything. The chandelier. Everything. Go out to the attic, the shed, the garage. Everything. And then everything that you owe. And down to the smallest detail that you can. The more detailed you can be, the better. And then total up. It may take you a couple of weeks. If it takes you that long, you've got too much stuff. <laughs> and that's a blessing. That's a blessing. That's as far as one person I know got in the program. <laughs> in a very positive way. They realized they're financially independent. They went through their garage. <laughs> no joke. I mean, it's funny, but it's pitiful. This guy had been sitting on a fortune. He used to collect old tools and, you know, all kinds of stuff and just cram them in. And it was a fortune's worth of stuff. And he just piled them up in there. When he saw that, tallied it up and realized, you know, I can realize X thousand dollars from this pile of stuff. And he had already begun to go through the other steps. He realized, that's it, I'm home free. <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting you go out and sell any of this. I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting you know about it. OK? That's important. I know that you're attached to that, you know, cheerleader's costume from 35 years ago, you know, that there's no way in, you know, the whole freeze is over that you could fit into. I know you're attached to it, that it's memories and like that. But when you find out it's worth $480 as an antique, listen, you know. <laughs> now, Many of you will say, well, hold it now. How about intangibles? Now, how about uh, the 40000 I spent on my education? I'm not interested. I'm not interested. I want tangible. I want what you can sell right now, what you can convert to cash right now listed. You know, in a lot of uh, industrial balance sheets, they'll put goodwill $1. <laughs> Is a token entry. So don't tell me about all those intangibles. That's fine. You know, in theory, you've been, you've been manifesting that education that you paid for. It's already showing up there some way, unless you just graduated yesterday. It's okay. This will still work for you. This will still give you a good picture of what it is that all that energy that you put out in the past, it looks like today. That and the corpus you're carrying around. Okay? Now, if you've been the sole supporter to a couple of other people, everything I'm saying tonight, today, is obviously geared to an individual. It gets too complex to try to gear, well, I'm, I, I'm you know, um, the, the breadwinner for a family of five and so on. Fine, you can translate it all, multiply by five, you know, whatever you want to do. And you know, it's applicable across the board. But the point is that it's, we're working as an individual here. So that's it on this step. Find out how much money has flowed into your life and find out what you have to show for it. This concludes Session 7. Please take the necessary time to answer the review questions for Session 7 on page 67 in your workbook. When you're ready to continue, answer the preview questions for Session 8 on page 69, and then continue listening. Step 2. 
What are you selling it for now? We're going to stop calling it money and begin to call it life energy because it is an equation versus earnings. You work, presumably, for money. A certain number of hours per week. You get a certain number of dollars per week. Dividing one from the other by the other, you get a certain number of dollars per hour. So let's look at that. These numbers, doesn't matter whether they're Canadian or US dollars, the numbers are just picked out of the air for them to balance out. Okay? They're picked just to round off. So let's say you work 40 hours a week and you get paid $200. So in theory, you're selling yourself for $5 an hour. That's simple. However, do you levitate to work? <laughs> now wait a minute, see, if you, if you didn't go to work, you wouldn't have commuting to work. See, so commuting is part of work. Because if you don't work, you don't commute to work. You commute to other things, but you don't commute to work. So now what we have to start tagging on here is whatever time or money expense is related to your work in order to make it realistic. Because that's totally unrealistic. I'm talking net, this is your net take home, all right? <coughs> After taxes. Forget taxes. So you commute. So there's some kind of money and time involved in the commute. So let's say it's uh, five hours a week, which then would have to be added, say, 45 hours an hour involved in this thing called work. And let's say it costs you $15 to maintain the car for those five hours. Okay, now this is getting more realistic. Now how about lunches or snacks. Now obviously a lunch bought at a place of work is a lot more expensive than the you know, sandwich you put together at home for most people. Again, this is on the average. You work it out for yourself. But at work food is a legitimate category. Let's say that all in all, as opposed to eating at home, it takes an extra five hours a week and an extra $15. Now, how about job costuming? <laughs> you really think I walk around like this every day? You gotta be kidding. <laughs> this costume I put on only when I'm doing a seminar. So yeah, this is costume. How about this? This is the only article of clothing that holds nothing down, holds nothing up, holds nothing in, holds nothing out. And it's a noose! It's a slipknot noose! Isn't that wonderful? It can also be used as a leash. <laughs> Now, I understand that there's uh, some, some myth, some mythology, that you can't show up at work with the same outfit two days in a row. <laughs> That's fascinating. <laughs> or if women wear pants to work, they gotta have a name on their butt. <laughs> and it's okay. So you pay 10 extra dollars or 20 extra dollars for a name on your butt. Right. Now, 20 extra dollars means what? That's a certain amount of your life energy. So figure it out for yourself. Find out the value, numeric value for the kind of stuff that you're buying because you think it's required for work, or it is actually required. And in a more serious vein, it may be a special work clothing or whatever. All right, there is a category <clears throat> that sociologists actually have a name for and that's what happens when you come home. As I said earlier, do you come home just all happy and feeling great? Or do you come home, oh, no, no, no. 
I am. Oh, I am the day. Give me a drink. I'm going to watch some television. Give me another beer. Or whatever recreational substance you find it's necessary to use. Well, the languaging for that is daily decompression. <laughs> daily decompression. Isn't it interesting? We live lives that are compressed. So we have to decompress. We have ways of telling ourselves that something might not be quite right. So yeah, we have daily decompression. A certain number of hours I've spent recovering from this making our living. We gotta get our living back because we've been making so much living. <laughs> That's gotta be given a monetary value. So whatever you use in those substances, and whatever time you are not a working human being, and if you have any doubts, ask your mate. <laughs> They'll tell you. Very often in no uncertain terms. You're useless for five hours after you come home from work. I don't even dare let the kids in to see you. I've heard that one. <laughs> and find out how much you spend on those substances. So not only do we have our daily decompression, but what do we do on weekends? We escape. We live lives that every day we've got to decompress from, and then every weekend we have to have escape entertainment. That's wonderful. <laughs> Well, if you're living a life that you don't have to escape nothing, I'm very, you know, a lot of my friends are really into movies and stuff like that. They're very frustrated with me. I see about a movie a year, mainly because I really need to keep my American passport up and every American has to go to a movie, you know, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> but this is so much more fun than going to a movie for me. Life is a lot more fun than a flat screen with, you know, various colors moving up and down on it. So I, you know, I don't understand having to escape from life. But that's my own judgment, you see. To find out how much you spend on escape entertainment. And if you weren't living a life where you would want to escape from it, therefore that wouldn't be there. So let's just say it's uh, five hours a week. Some people I know it's 50 hours a week. And let's say it's uh, $10 a week, just to round off. <laughs> While in this vein, what's the third one of that? We decompress, we escape, and then we vacate, right? <laughs> we vacate our lives. <laughs> Once a year, we vacate. that way, isn't it incredible? We're put on this earth, we're given this incredible opportunity at aliveness, and so we decompress from it, we escape from it, and then we vacate from it. <laughs> I, have, I haven't had a vacation in 15 years. I, or no, I'm sorry, let's put it another way. Every day of the last 15 years has been a vacation. This is my vacation. This is what I do in my vacation. And boy, is it fun. And there's nothing for me to vacate from. So why vacate from life? So be it. Vacation. So we prorate whatever we spend in those two weeks or whatever. Divide that by the other 50. And uh, let's say that's uh, two weeks would be about three hours a week. And $10 for a $500 vacation. One last category that I have here, you have to invent your own, discover your own. Many, many doctors agree that a large percentage of illness is directly related to work. Now, not just the stress factors and not just catching the bug because it's going around the office. I've got this image of this bug going around. <laughs> 
That's taking the germ theory a little too far. You know? <laughs> but it's all those other factors. It's the worrying, it's the this and it's the that. And I think we don't have to go to the latest issue of the AMA Journal or, or some erudite publication. I think we can look within and see, all right, how much of my illness is really copping out? I mean, this is a one legitimate excuse we have for copping out from work, besides vacating and, and escaping and so on. But it's just another legitimate cop out. The amazing thing is that most people, when they reach FI, financial independence, their illness drops off. They stop being ill as frequently. This is not a claim to salvation or anything else. The fact is they experience themselves much healthier. I, for one, would volunteer if there was a flu in the next town over. I'd volunteer. You know, wow, it gives me a week off, great. You know. How often have you laid in bed and taken your temperatures? It's real! <laughs> <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. Oh boy, I'm sick. <laughs> you greet it with joy. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> so get some idea, or some percentage, of how much is job-related illness. So let's say that's um, one hour a week. You know, even if you just spent 50, 52 hours ill, prorate that, and let's say $10. And whatever else applies. Now notice, I'm being consistent. I said in your balance sheet you don't deal with intangibles. Not, neither am I dealing with intangibles here. I'm not trying to give a monetary value to worry or to broken relationships because you're too damn busy working to pay attention to your relationship. Or the fact that your kids are on dope because you're never home and don't provide the parental you know, support. So those are intangible, so I'm not dealing with those. This is just what you can measure in terms of time and bucks. If you deduct all of these or add all the hours, you come up with 65 hours in this example. Deduct all that, and you come out with $130. See, I told you to make it nice and even. And so the reality is it's $2 an hour. <laughs> it is not surprising when I am working one-on-one, -on -one, when I used to, I don't do it now, when I used to work one-on-one, -on -one, to have that come out a negative figure. <laughs> not so outrageous where the reality is, when people are really being honest, that they're spending all of their lives supporting themselves and spending all of their lives in making the money to make the money to... And, uh, it's true. So they don't have any idea of how much they're really trading their life energy for. That figure becomes incredibly important. <coughs> This is only step two now, the first half of step two. Knowing how much you are currently, we're dealing with the present, knowing how much you're currently trading your life energy for, as accurately as you can. Incidentally, this is also a very, very good step if you're job hunting, to compare one job to another. You may find that the one that up here seems to have the highest <coughs> income, Reality is it's not, because commutation is a lot higher, because dress codes are different, because different things are expected. You're expected to entertain your coworkers or this or that. And all of a sudden, the ancillary expenses, those hidden expenses, become a lot higher. The other half of step two, still dealing in the present, how much money flows in and out of your life every single day. Keep track. Keeping track of every cent that flows in and out of your life. Every cent. In other words, what this step is, is about keeping track of every penny that flows in and out of your life. 
Another way of saying that is that you have to keep track of every cent that flows in and out of your life. Now, it took me about 11 seconds to cover that. You know, the unfortunate thing is that this is what people remember from the talk. Remember earlier I said, you know, I really detest it when people, oh yeah, that talk, that's the one in which you got to keep track of every cent going in and out of your life. 11 seconds, by now 23, out of an eight hour day, and that's what people remember. I guess because it's so outrageous to so many people. I didn't say every dollar. I don't care if you're a 30 or 50 or 100 thou a year person. I'm talking about every penny. Why every penny? Instead of rounding it off to the nearest dollar. How big is a finagler's constant? How big is a fudge factor? How close is close enough? Once we start fudging, when we start, once we start cheating like that, Hey, meaningless. This happens to be a superb spiritual discipline. What is this stuff? Your life energy. That's all it is. So what am I asking you to do? To be here now and pay attention to the use and the flow of your life energy. How simple. Spiritual teachings in a penny. <laughs> How can you ever look at a penny again without remembering your spiritual highest? <laughs> That's all it is. If you didn't exist, neither would it. <laughs> a third of your life is spent messing around with this stuff. How do you do that? How do you keep track of every penny? The badge of anybody who's been to this program is a little book. Now, everybody's waiting for the scam, everybody's waiting for what's he really in it for, what's he gonna sell us. Wrong, I don't sell these. There is no official little book. It's wonderful how our minds work. I'm looking for what is the catch. No, as a matter of fact, I got these five years ago, a whole stack of these for free from your very own Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, and I'm not giving them a plug. I don't even know if they're still in business, but they gave me, they gave me a little book. So there is no special little book. And every time a penny comes in or out of your life, you write it down. You write it down with a category with a category that describes the entry or exit of that penny accurately, and a category that reflects your particular lifestyle. And I'll be dealing a lot more with that. So you're walking down the block, and you see a penny in the ground. What do you think you do? You put your foot on it, you take out your little book, <laughs> open it to the third page, pick up the penny, put it in your pocket, and write it down. That's it. And if you're a generous type and all of a sudden you notice a bum a few feet away and you toss a penny to him, you take it out again. And you say, gay bum, one penny. Not just, well, they cancel each other out. That game doesn't pay off. You write it down. This concludes session eight. Please take the necessary time to answer the review questions for session eight on page 75 in your workbook. When you're ready to continue, answer the preview questions for session nine on page 77, and then continue listening. Step three, at the end of the month, you take out your little book and you have created these little categories that depict your specific lifestyle. And you have your monthly tabulation. You just get a big data pad or an old paper bag. <laughs> Whatever. I couldn't find the paper, so I couldn't do the program. <laughs> I 
I've actually heard that one. <laughs> oh, I've got all the figures in my little book. I just haven't gotten to put them on the big piece of paper. Now, when I say categories that depict your particular lifestyle, I mean categories that depict your particular lifestyle. They really are about your life. Now, in other words, it isn't food, clothing, shelter. You know, no. Under food, you, you have to devise your own subheadings. <coughs> By that I mean this. All right, here's some basic groceries, you know, your everyday food uh, at home, food that you eat at home. Okay, so let's call that at home. Now, maybe you uh, really enjoy going out to restaurants. Okay. Well, that ain't just food. I mean, you know, for value received, that's a lot more. So you got to list your restaurant meals, expenses. All right, now you may be into uh, the latest health foods. Okay, and to handle the boredom of that, you may be into counterbalancing with junk foods. <laughs> That happens to be one of my categories. I enjoy breaking bread with other people. So there, there's rare a night that we don't have a couple of people over for dinner. Nothing fancy. I mean, you know, the chandelier and the glassware and whatever. I'm not doing, you know, just whatever we're going to eat, we share with other people. And, and that is one of my ways of enjoying. So that would have to be a separate category. Now, it doesn't mean that... You know, there I am at the dinner table, and, oh, another potato? <laughs> there are ways around that that are more polite. The way we can work around that is when we come home with the groceries for that day, since we have to do kind of a, a breakdown of what is household, you know, that toilet paper and stuff. And, I mean, grocery stores sell a lot more than groceries nowadays. So we have to do some kind of breakdown. And in the process, we can also do an approximate breakdown. If, if normally this would, uh, I mean, this is made to serve six people, you know. Now, when I keep on saying approximately, I want to point something out that the grocery bill came to uh, 1488. I, I guess more accurately, 8488. <laughs> Don't want to be caught off base on little stuff. Okay. Now we estimate out of that. Well, well, just looking at what we got here, about 20 bucks was household. And let's see, of the other 6488, uh, the guest, that we have four guests for dinner. All right, there's four of us, so that's eight. Uh, all right, so about half of the rest of the food for tonight. So let's call that 20. And uh, okay, and then the rest is just normal food. So uh, 40 from 84, uh, 88, 44, 88. There you are. You're absolutely accurate to the penny in terms of the net result, total of it. But you can, those breakouts can be approximations. So under uh, entertainment, you put 20. Under household, you put another 20. And then under regular food, you put 44.88. OK, that's how it operates. And it can be done very quickly. It isn't like you're putting out all the cans. <laughs> that can be fun, too, but that's not what we're doing. <laughs> Every category has to be that way. So under shelter, okay, it may not be enough to just write, you know, a figure. A certain amount, if you're paying off your house, a certain amount is going to interest. Usually a humongous amount. Uh, it may be important to list that separately and how much is going to equity. Um, 
I don't want to get controversial, but if you're into bringing your secretary to the motel, put that down on the shelter or on the recreation. I don't want it. It's about telling the truth. And recreation is a wonderful category to tell the truth in. You see, in our languaging, once again, we have some clues. How much, how many people have you seen recreated? How many people have you seen wrecked? <laughs> it's a very, very pleasant and, and um, easy way for people to get in touch with the fact that they're alcoholics. <laughs> Great audience. I get laughs even when it's not a funny line. <laughs> I love it. Uh, it's true. When I was doing the, the personal counseling, the guy would come in with his sheet accurately done and so on, and there would be, you know, $247.16, you know, under booze. <laughs> and I'd look at him, and he'd look at it, and he'd look at me. <laughs> I wouldn't have to say a word. He'd be in AA the next week. <laughs> Especially when you compare it to his food bill over here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about breaking it down. See, if you're into recreational substances, it may be the fancy stuff that you impress your friends with and the rock gun that you use yourself. <laughs> that has to be the breakdown because they're really two different things. One is to impress people. And the other one is just to consume yourself. So that kind of breakdown that reflects your specific lifestyle. Under clothing. <laughs> I love the way people just want to have these generic categories. Clothing, yeah, everything is clothing. There may be job costuming. There may be a recreational costuming. Uh, your leather. Uh, <laughs> I'm into motorcycles. I have to wear a leather jacket. I don't know what you're laughing about. It may have to uh, enter the... Um, your uh, glitter suit that you wear to the disco and you just pay, you know, a three week salary for. <laughs> or fetish clothing. <laughs> By that I mean... <laughs> By that I mean there really uh, is such a category. Um, and it's not what you were tittering about. <laughs> People get very attached uh, to one particular thing of clothing. It becomes their, their, their thing. So somebody who's modest uh, expenditures in every other category, you look at the bottom of the closet, and it's got 223 pairs of shoes. <laughs> yeah, two dresses, uh, two uh, shirts, and, and 243 pairs of shoes. That's what's considered a fetish item. <laughs> Somebody else has, a, as a matter of fact, a tie was given to me by a fellow that had something, I don't know, 400 ties. He collected ties. That was his particular fetish item. Yeah. Okay. Every category. Going down every, invent your own category. That's critical. Find out how it is that you're putting out that life energy. Now comes really brutal stuff. At the bottom of each one, it may take a couple of months for you to really devise the categories that are very, very explicit to you. Now, you have a figure at the bottom of each of these columns. Okay, so over here we got the, no, we got the 8488, the famous 8488 on your food bill, and so on, all the way down. That's an abstraction. You can get away with that. Because it's totally an abstraction. It's, it's this thing like this, two zeros on top of each other, two circles, and then it's a couple of sticks, and then you're, it doesn't mean anything to you. 
It's just money. It doesn't mean anything. There's no direct interaction with it. It's just a number. That's why budgeting doesn't work. Because there's no relationship. There's no realness. Until you try this, you don't have to believe me on that. But now we can make this very real. And here's where it gets brutal. Translate that to hours of life energy. Remember in that example before, you came out with, in that example, that you're trading your life energy at $2 an hour. Okay, so 42 hours, you can round off on this, 42 hours of your life energy went into acquiring the stuff in this category. Oh boy, we're getting real now. No exaggeration. You look at your booze bill, at the famous $216 booze bill, okay, and 108 hours went into that booze bill. Oh my God, and all I got was hangovers. Oh, blah, blah, blah. That glitter suit, 34 hours. Oh my gosh. All right, it's at this point that the mantra comes in. No judgment. You're just telling the truth about it. So all that uproar, all that stuff that's happening for you, when you realize that you put in 52 hours for that, and you've got nothing that you can now look back of value, this gets hard. And it should, because you're finally getting real about money. Now money has a reality. It's linked to your life. It's your life energy. That's all it is. Now there's nothing wrong with spending your life energy. You're going to have to one way or the other. They ain't stopping time for you. So it may be a very appropriate way. After you've got that translated into hours at the bottom of each column, then you ask yourself that question of each column. Did I get value, commensurate, in line with my expenditure of life energy? Was that worth 42 hours to me? If you come up with the answer no, great. It's not about condemning yourself. It's about putting some kind of symbol, some kind of cute symbol, at the bottom of that column, <coughs> way at the bottom of that month's page. One symbol that I grew up in uh, recommended is simply a dollar sign with a slash through it. That's all. That you weren't getting value for that exchange of life energy. If on the other hand you weren't getting value because there wasn't enough life energy put into that. On your um, booze bill, you look at your, your list for wine, oh God, I would have enjoyed brand name stuff instead of generic wine. I'd like to see that increased. Okay, so you can put Arrowhead up at the bottom of that. That you would like to actually see that category increased. This is important. This is not about budgeting. It's not about depriving yourself. It's about seeing, are you getting fulfillment from the hours of your precious juice that you're spending on this category? If you're not a symbol, simply a symbol, that lets you at a glance see that in this category you're not getting value. It doesn't feel good. Or a symbol that I would like to increase and I would feel much better. I would get much more fulfillment if I up my expenditure money in this category. Fine. So the first question to ask in this tabulation, am I getting fulfillment commensurate, in proportion to my expenditure of life energy. Second question, and now it gets really hairy. Remember, back there in the first half, we talked about purpose and doing some effort at defining what your life, the vision for your life, or purpose for your life, about uh, 30% of you said that you, what your life was about was higher purpose. Another 
Another 15% said it's about contributing to others. That's good. That's fine. Good. All right. How is that expenditure of life energy in alignment with your stated purpose? Ah, let that one sink in. It's a heavy one. How is that expenditure of life energy in alignment with what you say your life purpose is? Oh yes, I'm about serving others. 108 hours in a booze bill, huh? It's about serving others. Tell me about it. Come on. Okay, now, if you find that a lot of these categories are not in alignment with your stated life purpose, if you find it very difficult to match spending, you know, X thousands of dollars on this gorgeous house overlooking this gorgeous lake and so on, while you're still proclaiming that your life is about serving others and serving God or contributing or blah, 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 and if you and your, you know, heart of heart, oh boy, I'm full of shit. Well, great. One of the two has to change because you can't have fulfillment. You're not in alignment. It's linking it all up. You see that? You're not in alignment. One or the other, either your stated purpose or what's happening here in reality is a lie. There's no alignment. Now, it's okay if you change your purpose, if you tell the truth. All right, really, my, my purpose is to live high on the hog for as long as I can. <laughs> and to hell with everybody else, and I don't care how many people in Ethiopia starve as I spend $5,000 on a sofa. That's all right, that's fine. That's the truth. Okay, now you're in alignment. That's the truth. I'm not interested in moralizing, I'm interested in that alignment. Now it's in line. Or you have to say, holy smokes, no wonder people drop out of the program after a couple of months. This is a rough one. That, nothing here looks like... <laughs> oh, my God. oh my God, I'm a total phony. There's nothing as a line. I mean, yeah, my food comes out the only thing. And even then, I'm feeling guilty about the Twinkies. <laughs> then remember the mantra, no judgment. It's just about telling the truth. That's a starting point. So fine, in each of those categories where it's not in alignment, and even your wonderful rationalizing mind can't rationalize that really spending all those hours of life energy on this category, totally out of alignment. I can't even rationalize them into alignment. Great. At the bottom of that column, you put some symbol like the dollar sign and a slash through it. And that's all. If on the other hand, you look at a category, you know, here I say my life is about zilch, and hardly any expense in that uh, category that reflect the zilch, fine. Great. The arrow hit pointing up, or some other symbol. This is now getting into the heart. <laughs> step four. This is step four. Step three is the tabulation itself. Step four is those questions. Asking those questions. There's one more question to ask of that monthly tabulation. If you didn't have to work for money, if you had a source of income separate from your work, if you could be doing the work that you want to be doing in the world, work in alignment with what your stated purpose in life is, thus you did not depend upon your work for money, what would that category look like? So obviously your job costuming category, possibly the uh, work food category, etc., would drop out. Estimate that. Estimate. One of the few times I'll say, just estimate what kind of lowering that would make for your monthly expenses. I just jot down a notation in the bottom of that month's tabulation. My total, if you're total, and of course you're totaling all of this up, so your total monthly expense, total monthly expense, 
You also have categories for income. Found pennies, you know, so on. You know, mug little ladies, whatever. So, you've got a total monthly income category. And then you subtract one from the other. And hopefully, since you're working this to every penny, what you got left over in your wallet and your checking account will balance precisely with that remainder, with that difference. So in this step, three questions. Crucial, the heart. Not more important than any other step. Every step is equally important. But in a sense, this is getting to the heart throb of the whole program. Those three questions. How am I, am I getting fulfillment commensurate with, in proportion to, my expenditure of life energy? Forget money. It's life energy. Second, is expenditure of this life energy in alignment with what I say or suspect or I'm beginning to think my life is about? And third, what would this category look like when I achieve financial independence? Which is defined very simple. It's having an income separate from, an income that supports you at the level that you're comfortable with, separate from whatever it is you're doing in the world. This concludes session nine. Please take the necessary time to answer the review questions for session nine on page 87 in your workbook. When you're ready to continue, answer the preview questions for session 10 on page 89, and then continue listening on the next disc.